All right, so moving on, um, let's take a peek at the greater and lesser tuberosities. I call them tuberosities. A lot of times, I think we refer to them as tubercles, so whatever your preference is. They're not trochanters, though, um, but they are analogous to trochanters in the femur. Okay, so if we're kind of looking at our greater and lesser tuberosities or tubercles of the shoulder, we're appreciative that there's a, a bunch of really important muscles, namely the rotator cuff muscles that insert into, this structure, into these structures. Um, if you want to uh, cause pain in your patient, okay, nine out of 10 times, you can kind of go to the bank on this. If you palpate their greater tuberosity, they will be uncomfortable. Okay? Almost every patient, shoulder patient I've ever seen has tenderness over the greater tuberosity. Okay? And it's not unreasonable to think why. Right? So why is that? Why would, why would that be an area that's so susceptible to tenderness? What inserts? Yeah, right? Which ones? Good. Okay, so greater trochanter, sorry, tuberosity, we're thinking the sit, <laughs> sit muscles, right? So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Okay? Supraspinatus is really probably more of an early AV ductor than an external rotator, although it probably does contribute a little bit to external rotation. It creates a force couple with the deltoid and works with the deltoid at creating full abduction. So it's kind of like the early abductor, and then the deltoid kind of kicks in and, and does the rest <laughs> for the most part. Um, Infraspinatus obviously is a what? External rotator, teres minor? External rotator. An extension. Okay, if the shoulder is flexed, it'll extend it. Okay? <laughs> So the sit muscles are there, okay? So they're important muscles and oftentimes an area of tenderness. We also have to think about the greater tuberosity, how it's this kind of you know, bump on the lateral aspect of the head of the humerus. So again, if we're already talking about reduction in space and we're looking at elevation, we can see that you know, if that greater tuberosity approximates that acromion, we're gonna have some problems. So what we're appreciative of is as we come into abduction, okay, we've gotta have a certain degree of external rotation that has to accompany that motion. If it doesn't, then we're gonna have an increase in that impingement. So when we think about, you know, not only it, are we starting off kind of behind the eight ball, so to speak, in regards to not enough motion, but we also are saying that we need very, very small and precise motions that have to accompany these larger motions in order to facilitate a situation where I don't impinge the structures that are underneath the space, okay? So it, it's not a good situation, right? Not a good situation. So. Um, and let's do this for a second. Let me have you guys stand up just for a moment. So um, what I want you guys to do is to start off with your right arm by your side with your thumb pointing forward, kind of like this, okay? What I want you to do is nice and easy, just kind of raise your arm in deflection, okay? Move your arm into abduction. Slap your classmate, and then come back down to your side again. What just happened? Yeah, we externally rotated. How much? Yeah, 90 degrees, right? I'm like, wait, 45? Right, we abducted. Do you guys remember externally rotating? I didn't say to externally rotate, right? We just flexed and then we went to an abduction, and then we came back down again. So I don't remember rotating, do you remember rotating? Right, so what, what happened there? Why is it that we have 90 degrees of external rotation that occurred with that motion? And if I try it again, you know, so if I do that again, oh, it does it again, right? So now I'm at 180. So what's going on there? <sighs> Tom has that look of confusion back there, Tom's gone. You should be confused, right? Because I don't remember rotating. <clears throat> so here's the deal. Let's, let's shorten the arc, and I'll show you where the rotation comes into play. So we went up to 90 degrees of flexion, abduction, and came down, right? So let's say, let's just go up to about 30 or 45 degrees. Now, very slowly, go from flexion to abduction. Do you see how you're rotating when you go into abduction? When you come back to flexion, you're internally rotating? You guys see how that's happening? So when you shorten that arc, you can kind of see that motion, that rotation actually occurring. So here's the point. Rotation, external and internal rotation, is a component motion 
of elevation. Elevation, what's that? It's flexion or abduction. Whether I flex or whether I, I abduct, rotation of my humerus is a component motion. It has to occur during those motions. And if we look at it, even without trying, it automatically occurs. And we might say that with abduction, we have external rotation. And with flexion, we have internal rotation. Right? So it's the major reason why we work on getting rotation back before we go after flexion and abduction with our patients. Because we want rotation first because it's component motion of elevation. And if we get that better, then elevation is going to be better. Okay? So go ahead and have a seat. So with abduction, when we're looking at this greater tuberosity, if I abduct here, I've got to have external rotation that occurs along with it so I don't impinge. Right? So I'm not impinging whatever structures are under here mainly supraspinatus and the bursa, right? The subacromial bursa lies here as well, okay? So that's greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity. So how do we find this? Well, we already found the acromion. Pretty easy to kind of identify that, hopefully for most of you guys, I thought found that pretty well. If I'm on the lateral board of that acromion and I drop down about an inch, boom, okay, I'm gonna find that greater tuberosity, okay? So find your acromion first, kind of know where that is, find the lateral border here drop down across the subacromial space and onto that greater tuberosity. And it's about an inch, I would say, or so for most people. How do I confirm? Same way we confirm the greater trochanter. How is that? Yeah, if I internally and externally rotate, so I should be feeling greater tuberosity, inner tubercular groove, lesser tuberosity. Inner tubercular groove, greater tuberosity. Inner tubercular groove, lesser tuberosity. Right? I'm kind of running across the valley here. I should be able to feel all those structures. Feel that little divot between the lesser and the greater. Can you guys feel that little space in there? Okay, so there are the sit muscles that are kind of located here. So if we look at our supraspinatus, right, that's the guy that does this. Right, so it really stinks to be the supraspinatus. Okay, because again, we don't, we're not in a good position here. So it runs literally like that. So if there's going to be a problem, can you see how that muscle is going to be an issue? Right? So oftentimes um, the supraspinatus is likened to um, a man losing his hair as he gets older. As you get older, your hairline thins. Sorry to inform you guys. So does your rotator cuff. Right? As we get older, our rotator cuff over time begins to kind of just, just thin. And sometimes I've had guys come in, usually in the 50s, 60 year old guys, that said, yeah, I don't understand my shoulder, you know, I can't even raise my arm, my shoulder really hurts, what were you doing? Digging a trench? I mean, what were you doing? Lifting bricks? Oh no, I was just picking up a pencil, or I was grabbing a dish from the top shelf. Right? So it's really, really thin from years of abuse, from years of impingement, from years of poor vascularization. And now, one little thing is like the straw that breaks the camel's back. So a lot of people we see with rotator cuff tears is atraumatic. It's like this kind of like, I didn't even do anything, and, there, and they have it. Because supraspinatus is in a bad position. Okay, so if we're going to palpate this muscle, we can palpate the muscle belly, we can palpate the tendon. So the muscle belly, we know, is really just a matter of finding the spine of the scapula and coming into that supraspinous fossa, right? So our supraspinata should be occupying that space. In fact, it's actually hard to feel the top border of the, of the scapula because it's usually fairly substantial and it occupies a good portion of that space. It'll be interesting, in your career you'll come across individuals with suprascapular nerve palsy, and they'll actually have atrophy of this on one side versus another. So you'll see a hollowed out region here in that population. For whatever reason, they have some sort of nerve injury. So often, oftentimes you'll see that. Um, so, so that's where the muscle belly is. So how am I going to confirm that I'm on it? So I'm palpating the, the bone, I'm going onto that space, how would I confirm that I'm on that? What's that? Yeah, I could resist abduction, and I would do it early. I wouldn't do it up here, right? I'd keep the arm at their side, and I'd say isometrically push into my hand and have them abduct, and I should feel that muscle engaging, right? But the tendon ends up at the anterior aspect of the shoulder, and sometimes the best way of palpating that, and I don't think I have this listed for you, so you may want to write this in, is to put their arm behind their back like this. Now, a lot of people I see aren't going to be able to tolerate that, so try it if you, if you can. But what that does is it really kind of brings out the prominence of that greater tuberosity and it allows you, it kind of stretches that tendon a little further and allows you to palpate that tendon a little bit easier. So just like we palpated greater lesser, I palpate that greater tuberosity, put their arm behind their back, and now you're kind of on that tendon of the supraspinatus. Okay? 
So we can firm by external rotation or we can kind of position them with our arm behind their back and that kind of brings out that greater tuberosity. So if I wanted to do ultrasound or electric stim and I wanted to expose that tendon that's having some issues, I might do that ultrasound with them in this position because it kind of brings it away from underneath the acromion. It kind of brings it out to, out to uh, the play. Okay? So that's the supraspinatus, greater or lesser tuberosity. Infraspinatus is really kind of in a very similar location. It's just now below, right? So it's a larger muscle. It's going to occupy the infraspinous fossa, kind of down in here. And so this muscle kind of comes out to the side and eventually ends up on the greater tuberosity as well. Right? So it's going to kind of run like this. And it's going to end up on that greater tuberosity slightly below the supraspinatus, kind of that middle aspect of the greater tuberosity. But where we lose it really is where the posterior deltoid comes down. So the posterior deltoid is going to come down like this, and that infraspinatus is going to kind of duck underneath the posterior deltoid. And then it kind of goes away, and then we can palpate it again in the front. So we're just going to simply, you know, to identify this, just pop down into that inner spinous space. Infraspinatus is a huge what? What does it do? External rotator, right? One of the main external rotators. So we can, again, confirm, we can resist external rotation and palpate. So, you know, have them resist, relax, palpate, have them resist, relax, palpate. Try to palpate that all, the, all along the length as it kind of courses out laterally and it dives underneath the posterior deltoid. An important point here, and we'll come back to this a lot, and I want to, I want to point this out, is when you look at the infraspinatus, when you look at the infraspinatus in your cadavers as well, this muscle is obliquely oriented, right? So it runs like this, okay? It's not like this. Okay, but it's obliquely oriented. So when it pulls, right, it's easy to see how that's going to produce external rotation, right? But what will it also do relative to the position of the humeral head? It'll, so stabilize, but what direction is it going to cause the humeral head to glide? Maybe it's slightly posterior. So if I'm pulling from here, what is it going to do? It's going to produce compression, right? It's going to take that humeral head and jam it into the glenoid. You guys see that? If I'm pushing from, pulling from here. If I'm pulling from a vertical, you see how it's going to pull it down? It's going to, it's going to kind of take that humeral head and pull it downward, right? But if I'm at an oblique angle, a portion of this force vector is actually going to create force in both. It's going to kind of pull it toward compression, but you see how it's also going to pull that humeral head down? So Danny was right, it is going to provide compression and stabilization. Rotator cuff provides stabilization, but why? Well, because part of that, that vector that it's pulling is going to kind of move that humeral head into the glenoid. So it's creating sta a stable environment for that glenoid, the glenohumeral joint. But it's also going to cause a slight migration of that humeral head inferiorly. That is huge. That's critical. Let's say for a minute we have a you know, um, an issue with our infraspinatus, a tear, let's say, in the infraspinatus. So now that inferior glide can't function at the humeral head. And now I'm raising my arm without that inferior glide. Can you see how that can set you up for impingement? That space that's already less, when I come up, right, when I come up like this in abduction, watch close, when I come up like this in abduction, I need inferior glide, right? So I come up like this, and the supraspinatus is doing this and pushing it into the into the glenoid. Let's say the supraspinatus is gone. We have a nerve palsy. So now as I'm elevating, I never get that inferior glide. Bam, it's going to jam. We want it to do this. Right? We want it to glide down as it's elevating. We don't want it to jam into the roof of the shoulder. So the infraspinatus, the rotator cuff, and the way that it's arranged in regards to its configuration and its relative force vector that it has on the humeral head is really critical at reducing this issue of impingement. So if I have a rotator cuff that starts to fatigue, you know, I'm pitching fastballs and I'm in the ninth inning, and my rotator cuff is fatiguing, I'm more susceptible to having less than normal stability of the shoulder and less than normal inferior glide. This joint, and you can see on the skeleton, this joint on all of us would fall off of our body if it wasn't for the rotator cuff. And if it wasn't for the muscles, there, there's no stability in this joint. It's like a big giant beach ball and a little golf tee. There's no stability, right? So it needs the rotator cuff to provide that. More important than even movement and strength is the rotator cuff's role in providing stability for the glenohumeral joint. So it's an important thing to kind of think about as we begin to palpate and think about these structures. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, both very important external rotators, but also 
dynamic stability of the shoulder. All right, um, Terry's minor. Let's do one more. Terry's minor and Terry's major. So remember, which one is below and which one's on top? Minor's on top, major's below, right? But the major's bigger, okay? Terry's major is kind of like a mini latissimus, right? Kind of very, really very much serves a very similar function <laughs> as a latissimus. Um, and so we're going to kind of see that that occupies kind of down more toward the inferior angle, whereas, you know, from midway on this lateral border of the scapula upward, right, that's pretty much Terry's minor, okay? And so we're going to kind of, you know, get a sense of finding that lateral border of the scapula, and then if we palpate kind of on our way out to the humerus, that's where we're going to find that Terry's minor. How are we going to know if we're in the Terry's minor or Terry's major? How do we differentiate that? How do we confirm? Yeah, so what does the teres minor do? External. external, teres major is internal, right? So if you're kind of palpating down in this area, right? Kind of going, well, how would you determine whether you're on the minor or the major? Simply resist ER. If you feel it kind of engaging under your finger, you know it's the minor. Engage IR. If you feel it engaging, then you know it's the major. <laughs> All right, so you want to find the lateral border first, and you're just kind of basically palpating that space on the way out to that, out to that humerus. It's going to kind of run in this location here. Major's kind of down here, minor's kind of up this way. That's what I want to say about that. Um, you can actually, within the axilla, you can actually grab it. Some people say, grab it like you're grabbing a hamburger. Right? So you can actually come underneath there and grab the Terry's minor. Kind of grab it like that. Okay? That's going to be the third. Everything's a food analogy, in case you haven't noticed that with me. Um, it's going to end up also in the greater tuberosity, right? So it's one of those sit muscles. Where does the lats attach? Where do the lats attach? Right. Right, so the floor of the bicipital groove or the intertubercular groove, so it's kind of on the floor. So the way that I sometimes think about this is super lettuce sub, right? Super spinatus, <laughs> told you food. Super spinatus, lettuce, latissimus, subscapularis. Subscapularis is on the lesser tuberosity. Super spinatus, lettuce, latissimus, sub. Um, Keep going, we're on a roll, right? Since we talked about the subscap on the lesser tuberosity, right? Subscap's gonna come from the anterior aspect of the scapula, right? So we kind of can't feel it very well because it's kind of between the ribs and the scapula. Um, one way we could feel it is kind of like we do with Dr. Ben, if we put them on his side and we kind of put that arm behind their back, we can kind of get in underneath that. Okay, so I'm kind of coming along that medial border and then I'm just kind of bringing my thumb around to the anterior border. Now, do I know that I'm distinctly on that subscat? Not really, but how will I know? If I feel it do what, when I do what? If I feel it contract, when I do what? Yeah, internal rotation, right? So I'm going to resist internal rotation, and I should just feel a little bit of a tensing of that muscle kind of on the anterior border of the, of the scapula. Where I spend most of my time palpating this muscle because I use it for treatment is in the axilla. Right? So this is one of those like, ew, parts of physical therapy, right? So I always put a towel. Let me do it with Dr. Ben. I know Dr. Ben's cleaning it first thing in the morning, so we'll go for it. You may be lying on your back for me, sir. Oh, you're taking your shirt off? Okay. I need some muscles, right? You can help through Pink Floyd if you want. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me make sure. I'm... Help me through what? Pink Floyd. That's right. Just another brick in the wall, man. Pretty much. <laughs> Okay. That's scary. Wow. It literally just got scary right then. Okay, so a couple things we can do here, guys. One thing we can do is if, if I take Dr. Ben's arm and I kind of pull it up, it kind of makes some space and it kind of brings the scapula into a little bit of protraction and it kind of allows me to kind of get onto that anterior border. What I often do, and you guys may have a hard time seeing this exactly, is I'll kind of you know, take a towel and I'll basically kind of go into the axilla like this. And as I'm in the end of the axilla, I'll kind of go pretty deep. I can actually take my fingers and kind of go anteriorly and I can feel that I'm on the anterior border of the scapula. So I mean, we talked about trying to feel that subscap fossa on the medial side. It's better to feel it on the lateral side because it often then translates into a really good location for treatment. 
Okay, so I'm kind of feeling it right there. I might say to you during the practical, well, how, do I, how do you know you're on it? Well, I'll resist internal rotation. And when I do that, it pushes my fingers off of that structure. So I know, you know it's, a, it's a hard structure in there. I know it's the scapula. Well, how do I know it's the internal, how do I know it's the subscap? Well, I'll kind of resist internal rotation. Well, it could be the teres major. The teres major would be down a little bit further. Okay? So why is this? an important area, and why might I go in here on a, on a fairly regular basis and do things like this? Now, Dr. Ben will tell you if I do this for about the next five minutes, <laughs> he might never volunteer to teach this course again. He'll be like, I'm not having that person abuse me anymore. But it's not a really comfortable thing. So why would I do that to this poor, helpless young man? We're malingerers. Yeah, he's a, he's a malingerer, and we gotta get him back to work. That's one way, one reason. Why else would I do that? So I'm doing transverse friction massage to the subscapularis. It's kind of like the clinical read, like you go, well, why am I palpating this muscle? Here's why. Because it can translate into treatment. So why would I want to do that? Think about what the subscap does. Okay, so what motion would be limited if it's tight? External rotation, right? It's kind of like your hamstrings. If your hamstrings are really, really tight, okay, well, it's going to limit your ability to flex your hip, right? So I may want to loosen those up so I can move further. So if my subscap is really, really tight, it may be one of the reasons, and it often is one of the reasons, or at least a contributory reason, as to why people have limited external rotation. So I go in and free this muscle up, and sometimes I get another 10, 15 degrees of ER, just from, just from working the subscap. Right? It was like, really? Like, I thought, I've been working on joints for years to try to get more external rotation. And now I'm finding, wow, that really, really super tight subscapularis actually could be a major contributor to limitations of ER. So it's important muscle to palpate because we can translate it to treatment. So try palpating it as we did with the scapula with them on their side, go along the medial border, and then try just kind of going right into their axilla. We have enough towels for everyone. Okay. Choose your lab partner wisely. That's it. <laughs> All right. So I think that's good. What do you guys think? Any questions? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscap. A little clinical stuff for an infer, good measure. Yeah, I mean.